going to learn from the Zera Shimshon. Last week I gave a little bit of a background about the Zera Shimshon. And we're going to learn from Parashat Shlach Lecha, which uh, the theme of the parasha, of course, is the sin of the spies. And Moshe sends spies into Eretz Israel, and they come back. There's a very big uh, argument what exactly was going on there because we know most commentaries say they spoke Lashon Ara about Eretz Israel. Nevertheless comes a big question that says, but wait a minute, they were saying the truth. They were saying that everything that they saw was the truth. So first of all, Lashon Ara is the truth. It's just saying it in a way that nobody benefits from it. Besides the point that what they did is they gave their own commentary. And nobody asked them if to give commentary or not. They were just sent to find the information and then come back. And nobody was expecting them or they didn't need to add on that anything. But nevertheless, we find that from the 12 uh, spies that were sent, two of them were good. Yoshua Binun, who was the servant of Moshe Rabbeinu, and Kalev ben Yifuneh. And for whatever reason, they were the ones who were chosen to, to not to sin with the, with the spies, and we're going to learn from a verse from the Torah that Moshe Rabbeinu changed Yeshua's name. On Shabbat, I don't know if you were here, but I was talking about it, that it says in this parasha, Vayikra Moshe lehoshea binun Yehoshua. And Moshe called Yehoshua, Hoshea binun Yehoshua. How can it be, this is not what we're going to talk about today, but I was addressing it on Shabbat. How can it be that now the Torah says that Moshe called Hoshea Binun Yoshua when we found, find many times in previous parashot that his name was already Yoshua? I mean, we find that so many times. But nevertheless, the answer is that even then his name was Hoshea, but the Torah is referring to him as Yehoshua for the future when his name is going to be changed. But nevertheless, let's read from the Zerah Shimshon and we'll see what he says here because we're going on the, weeks, uh, on the verse that it says Vayikra Moshe lehoshea binun Yehoshua Moshe called Hoshea binun Yehoshua This can be found in, with this, in the Parashat Bamidbar in chapter 13 verse uh, 16 Rashi explains, Rashi is a commentator, he explains Yudke means Hashem Yoshiacha me'atzat me'raglim. Hashem is going to save you from the bad advice that the uh, spies uh, gave. Now comes a big question. Why is it saying Yudke will, uh, will, uh, will uh, save you? Lama Yudke Yoshiacha v'alo afilu ot achat min Hashem yechol gam ken. First of all, what Yudke? Yudke means the letter Yud and the letter He. That comes from the name of Hashem, Yudke Vavke. First of all, and most important, why half the name of Yud Kevavke? Why only Yud and the He? Comes a different question that the Zerash Mishon is asking. Why Yud and the He? Isn't Yud enough? Why you need two letters? More than that, Afilu ot achat min Hashem yechol gam, yechol. Even one letter from Hashem's name is enough. If Moshe already wants to give Yoshua a letter to protect him, then just give the Yud. Why you need two, two letters, Yud and a He? First of all, as a side note, this is one of the places in the Torah, we, we find many places in the Torah, but this is one of the places in the Torah that we see that changing the name by adding a letter makes a huge difference in the person's blessing and the person's protection, health, parnasa, the livelihood and so forth. We find that with Sarah, that her name was Sarai, here the, the letter was switched from a yud to a hey. With Avraham, we find that his name was Avram, then they added a hey, Avraham. So here is another name that we find that a, a letter was added. Oh, suddenly it's a whole different thing. But nevertheless, Nazar Shimshon is asking, why did you need two letters to save Yoshua? Isn't one letter enough? Why Yud K? Could, should have been one letter. Not in that. Gam ken leoshia matzat meraglim. So, one letter to add to Yoshua's name could be enough to save from the sin of the spies. Not only that, but really when we're looking at it, Moshe didn't add two letters, Yud and a He, he added only a Yud, because his name was already 
Hoshea. So he just really added a Yud and it became Yehoshua. More than that, Ve'od ma tzorech l'shtei dvarim. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu need two actions? One action is to add the, the letters to the name and the other action that Moshe Rabbeinu prayed for him. He says, Hosafat ha'ot shel Hashem ve'gam itpaler lav. Ve'aloch b'chad aminai usagi. One action is enough. So we have here a few questions. First question is, how come then Moshe Rabbeinu added the letters to Yoshua's name? First of all, and why does it say specifically the Yud and the He and not one letter is enough? Or could it be any letter? So this is the first question. The second question, why did Moshe Rabbeinu need to do two actions, the adding the letters and the praying in order to save Yehoshua? Okay, this is the question that the Zerah Shimshon is asking. And in order to understand that, is throwing us, is referring us to the Zohar to read a certain portion of what the Zohar says in order to understand uh, what he wants to teach us. And this is, of course, Zohar from Parashat Srach. And it says as follows, Moshe. Moshe sent the spies from the desert of Paran. And again, this is now quoting the Zohar. We're reading from the Zerah Shimshon, but we're quoting the Zohar, what we're reading right now. And it says as follows, Kulam Anashim, they were all heads of the nation of Israel. Kulhu zakain havu vereshed Israel havu. They were all righteous. And not only that, they were all heads of all the tribes of Israel. So when Moshe Rabbeinu sent the spies, they were not uh, sinners. They were actually, first of all, they were all tzaddikim. But more than that, they were each one ahead of each tribe. But, aval, but nevertheless, even being righteous, they still plotted with each other, hey, let's, uh, let's uh, change a little bit what we see here. And they took on themselves a bad, what's called a tzara'a, they took, made a bad advice. And they, using the word, the Zohar uses the word legarmaihu, to them, to themselves, why? Here is the secret what, what was wrong with the spies. Now we go back to a, a different source, to the scripts of the Ariya Kadosh, Rabbi Yitzchak Luria, and he says there's something very interesting. The Arizal says that every one of these uh, uh, spies, they went into Eretz Israel, each one was presenting one tribe. The second that they went into Eretz Israel, the soul of each one of the tribes got incarnated in them, got what's called impregnant in them. So the person who was presenting the Shevet of Shimon, then the soul of Shimon was impregnant in him. The person who was uh, uh, representing the tribe of God, then the soul of God went in them. This is what the Arizal says. But, the second that they went into Eretz Israel and they were plotting with each other, let's uh, change the information, let's do something wrong. Right away, the souls of the Shvatim, of the tribes, left them and they, they were stayed by themselves. Now we continue. What was the benefit when they decided to do this uh, plot, to say, to talk bad about the land of Israel. What was the benefit here? Ela Amru, what did they say? I alun Israel ara. What's going to happen if the nation of Israel is going to walk into the land of Israel? You know what's going to happen? Nitambar anan milehevei reishin. We're going to be fired from our jobs. Up until now, we are each and every one of us a president of a tribe. Nesi Rosh B'nei Israel. This is a uh, I mean, the right way is called the prince, the head of the tribe. In our generation, they will be called the president, the head. They knew that if they walk into Eretz Israel, that's it. They're going to be switched. They're going to lose their status. Why? At the time of the, de the desert, it was a different uh, level. And they were called the level of Leah. But nevertheless, if they walk into Eretz Israel, then it changes the status. Ve'yimnei Moshe, 
רישי נחרני, now משה is going to come, we will be fired, we're going to lose our status, and משה רבנו will appoint other people. דה אנן זכנן במדברה למה ורשין. But now when we're in the desert, we, uh, we merit to be the heads of the tribes. אבל בערעה לא נזכה, but once we go into ארץ ישראל, we lose our status. ועל דה נטלי עת אבישה לגרמיו. And that's why they took on themselves this bad advice. So, hey, let's uh, say the land is bad. We don't have to go into Eretz Israel. Now we keep our status. We'll stay presidents here. But what was the result? Me too, Inun, Vechol Inun, Denatlan, Milayu. All of them died. And all the ones who listened to them also died. So we learned here two things. First of all, they spoke Lashon Ara. What was the result? They died. Who else died? The one who spoke, the one who listened to the Lashon Ara. And the one who accepted the Lashon Ara. That in itself is a lesson, lesson what Lashon Ara means. How severe it is. Even if it's the truth. Even if they said the truth. But they manipulated it. They said it in a way that wasn't supposed to be said. Nevertheless, they died and everybody who listened to it died. But what really do we learn from that? That they cared about their status. They said if we're going to go into the land of Israel, the status will be changed, will be fired, we're not going to be the heads of the tribes anymore. Moshe Rabbeinu will fire us and will give the job to somebody else. That's what the Zohar says. Okay, now let's go back to the Zer Shimshon. And the Zer Shimshon is quoting the, 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 Zohar, the Zohar. Now it says as follows, The sages of Kabbalah have written, and this is specifically referring to the Arizal, and it, says it can be found in the gate that is called Sha'ar Ruach HaKodesh. This is one of the scripts of the Arizal, specifically in Tikkun Zayin. It says over there, Sheshem Yud K, Eino Shore Al Baalei Ge'ava. Oy, oy, oy. The name of Hashem, Yud K, cannot dwell on a person that has pride. What's called a Baal Ge'ava. Why? The word Ge'ava, Gimel, Hey, Vav, and Hey. This means pride. This is ego. This is the ego in our generation, or in any generation, but ego, Ge'ava. The numerical value of Ge'ava is 15. Gimel is 3, Aleph is 1, Vav is 6, and Hey is 5. Which is equal to the name Yud and Hey. Yud and Hey is 15 too. So what is the Rizal says? That the name Yudke cannot dwell the Shekhinah cannot dwell on a person that has an ego, that has some type of a yeshut, what's called a ge'ava. Vehovil v'she'elu anashim chatu mi'chamat ha'ge'ava. What was their sin, the Zohar says? Ge'ava. I want to be the president. Ego. I don't want somebody else to be. I want to be the head. I want to be the top notch. Since they had ge'ava, then the name of Yudke was removed from them. And what was the Geva? They were afraid that they would lose their status. That was their ego. And since they had the ego, that was the sin. So the name Yudke Vavke could not dwell on them. That was, that's what the, what the Arizal explains in Sar Ruach HaKodesh. Okay, so now we understand why specifically the name Yudke was added to Yoshua. And also what was their problem? Now we can understand another thing. Mishum hachi, from there we can understand. Lirmoz al ze, hosif ot achat, ma'ashem, v'nitzarfa im ot arishona shel hoshea shiot hei. But we see that the name Yudke was added to Yoshua. Really, it wasn't really added because he already had the hei. Moshe only added to him the Yud. And he said, v'amar, Yudke Yoshiacha. The name Yud and then hei will be your salvation, your help, your protection from the Atzat HaMeraglim, from what they decided to do. Meaning, Klomar, Ra'oi hu she'ashem Yeshuacha lefi she'aya anav. Why would the name of Hashem, Yudke, protect Yeshua? Moshe also prayed for him. Isn't the prayer enough? Maybe Hashem, uh, uh, maybe Moshe Rabbeinu could say, I'm giving you a Yud. You already have the hay, right? Because your name is Hoshea. So really, when you're looking at the text, he only gave him a Yud. But specifically he said Yud K. Why? Because the name of Hashem will be your protection and your salvation. Why? But why would Yud K will help him? You know why? 
לפי שהיה עניו, only because יהושע was humble. היא had מידת הענווה. If he would not have מידת הענווה, the name י"ק would not help him. This is what he's saying, this is the חידוש. כדי שלא יחטא כמוהם, because he was humble, and משה רבנו now said, now I'm going to bless you that the name י"ק will be upon you, so you're not going to sin like them. Now we understand why he prayed for him. וזו אינה תפילה ממש, this is not a real prayer that משה did, אלא שנראית כמו תפילה, it sounds like a תפילה, it sounds and it looks like משה רבנו prayed for, for יהושע, הוא באמת אינה, and really it's not a prayer, אלא טענה בהכרח כדי לקבל עזרו מקודש. It's not necessarily a prayer that משה did, rather he was saying, in order for the name י"ק to protect you, is because you are humble. If Yeshua would not be humble, then the, the name of Yudke would not help him. Now we understand why Moshe Rabbeinu, it says, Ve'itpalel Moshe al Yeshua. That's why Moshe prayed for Yeshua. Now we can understand. Ve'hashtanicha. Now it's comfortable to us to understand. She'itpalel Yeshua ve'lo al Kalev. How come Moshe Rabbeinu prayed on Yeshua, not on Kalev? What is it? Uh, Uh, mafia here? You're praying on him and not on him? That doesn't sound nice. But here we understand why Moshe prayed for Yoshua and not Kalev. Why? The Bishlama Yoshua ya muhzak Boshayanav. Because Moshe Rabbeinu knew with no doubt that Yoshua was humble. He had Midat Anava. How do we know that? Go to the book of Shmot, chapter 33. Verse 11, what does it say? Umesharto, and the servant of Moshe Rabbeinu, Yoshua binun, na'ar lo yamish. He was a young man. He would not move away from the tent of Moshe Rabbeinu. He didn't move his sight for one second. What do we learn from that? Ubevaday, shaya midabek bedarkei rabo. So Yoshua didn't leave for one second Moshe Rabbeinu. Can you imagine being the servant of Moshe Rabbeinu, being the shamash, the one who's helping Moshe Rabbeinu? So if Moshe Rabbeinu was uh, very humble, he was the most humble of all, and Yoshua was his student, then we'd learn from that, and for sure, Yoshua went in the path of Moshe Rabbeinu, and he was humble too. And it says, how do we know that Moshe Rabbeinu was humble? Then go to the book of Bamidbar, chapter 12, verse 3, Moshe, anav no, then Moshe Rabbeinu was the, very, the most humble person ever existed. So if Moshe Rabbeinu was anav, he was humble, then so much more so, then you learn that his student, His follower, his disciple, his servant, Yeshua, was also humble. אבל בקלב לא היה משה כל כך מוחזק בו. משה רבנו, with Kalev, he didn't know if he's humble or not. משה רבנו says, Yeshua, that's my student. I know he's humble. I know he has מידת הענווה. Kalev, I'm not so sure. I don't know him so well. ומשום אחי, and therefore, לא התפלל אליו. He didn't pray for him. And we also find, this can be found in the translation that is called Targum Yonatan. Yonatan ben Uziel, he says, V'echad k'chama Moshe anvatnute, k'ra Moshe l'Yoshua benun Yehoshua. Moshe Rabbeinu, because he was humble, and he knew that Yehoshua is humble, so he called Yehoshua benun, Hoshea benun Yehoshua. And then he's sending us to a reference, ve'ayen od mize la'il beparashat lech lecha. He's sending us to a reference in parashat lech lecha for the, on the verse, al pasuk v'ayet o halo, that Avraham Avinu turned away his tent. He's just giving a reference about the translation of Targum Yonatan. But what do we learn from this part? Moshe Rabbeinu says, listen, Yoshua Binun is my servant. I know him. I know that he has midat ha'anava. Kalev, I'm not too sure. So we kind of understand now why Moshe Rabbeinu prayed for Yoshua and not for Kalev. But let me finish the paragraph, then everything will, come, everything will be become uh, much more clearer. Now we ask him another question. Now we have to understand why the commentaries explain Now we really want to understand why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray for Yoshua and not for Kalev. That doesn't sound nice. The kushia miikar alita, the difficulty of the this question, we can be we can find it right from the beginning. Demai ulimia de kalev meshar meraglim. Maybe the power of kalev 
was greater than the rest of the uh, spies. Shari botasha kulam yukshirim. In the beginning, when they all went into Eretz Israel, all the meraglim, all the spies were kshirim. They were holy. They were tzaddikim. That's what we know. So Pakalev was uh, kind of in the same uh, level of them. Vim ayam itpalel al Kalev. So if Moshe Rabbeinu prayed on them when they walked in, then all of them were in the level of tzaddikim, the heads of Bnei Israel. then Moshe Rabbeinu should have prayed for all of them. Technically, if this is the case. That Hashem should save them from a sin. And worse than that, from bad thoughts. You know how, how devastating could be bad thoughts? Look amazingly what he says here. He says that, let's go back a few paragraphs, why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray for Yoshua and not for Kalev? And if Moshe Rabbeinu should have prayed for Kalev, then he should have prayed for all the Meraglim. Right? Because Kalev, every, in the beginning, everybody was in a high level. So if already we're asking, why is Moshe not praying for Kalev? You should ask, why isn't Moshe Rabbeinu praying also for the spies? That uh, would make sense, that Moshe Rabbeinu should pray, that all of them should not sin. But look what he's saying here. We have to see very careful between the words because when you're reading type of teachings, especially like the Zerah Shimshon, you want to see in between the words what he's saying. What is he saying here? Hayalo lit palel nami. He should have prayed also al kulam on all of them. Shashem yatzilem. That Hashem should save all of them from rot, from the sin, from achet. Umi machshavot rot. Of in bad thoughts. Saying here that the severity of a sin is just as bad of bad thoughts. Because where do you come up with all the behavior? From the thoughts. So look what the Zerah Shimshon is saying. Moshe Rabbeinu should have prayed for them to save them from two things. Sin and bad thoughts. Making now that the bad thoughts are equal to the sin. So we have to learn from that that it's not only that the action that is devastating, it's also the thoughts are devastating. Sometimes you don't do the sin, but you're thinking what you would want to do. What I wish to do. What I would wish for that person to happen right now. How many times do you see people, they have such hate or jealousy and what they're thinking about another person, they don't say anything. On the outside they even smile. But the inside is full of hate. So here we have another tip that he says, Moshe Rabbeinu could have or should have prayed for all of them to save them from the sin and bad thoughts. But, El avadai tzich lomar, but here we 100% can say the prayer that Moshe Rabbeinu did had nothing to do with praying for Kalev and the spies. Why? You know why Moshe Rabbeinu did not pray for the spies? Technically, that's, the big, that's a very good question. If Moshe Rabbeinu thought or had a vision or felt that they're going to sin, why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray for them? Technically, we should have found Moshe Rabbeinu saying, hey, let me pray for all the spies that they should not sin. But how do we know that Moshe Rabbeinu wasn't even, had the idea of, of praying? He didn't even want to pray. Why? Because every person has bhira. You have a choice to do whatever you want. This is called your own uh, will. And not only that, kol adam yishlo bhira veratzon. Every person has free will and his own desire. I don't want to pray for you, you have to battle with your own free will. So we see 100% here that the prayer that Moshe Rabbeinu did had nothing to do with saving the, the spies, not the ten spies, not Kalev, not all of them together. From the only reason, because each and every one of us is given free will, one should not pray for another person that his uh, free will should be decided for him. Then what's the free will here? You all have free will, you decide what to do, just, don't, just do the right thing. And we understand from that Moshe Rabbeinu did not have the fear here. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't fear. Maybe some of them will sin. All of them will sin. All of them will be good. All of them will go bad. Moshe Rabbeinu didn't even have the fear. He says each and every one of them has their own free will. Let them do whatever they want. And Kalev also. Let him decide what he needs to do. Kalev was like all of them. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I'm not intervening. You have to deal with your own free will. Moshe, hayu az kulam kshirim. Because when Moshe Rabbeinu sent them, in his eyes, they're all kosher, they're all tzaddikim, they're all righteous. 
בכלל. Because if, this is, if he wouldn't think that, he wouldn't even send them. If Moshe Rabbeinu would not think that the spies are good or kosher, as it says, ksherim, he wouldn't even send them. Because he knew that they're righteous, he sent them. אלא שאף על צד הספק רצה לתמוך יד יהושע בתפילה, but nevertheless, even though there was a doubt, specifically יהושע, he wanted to support with a prayer. Why? First of all, the prayer. ניצחת שמן השמיים לא הניחו להיות ניסעת בעצתם. He was worried about יהושע, that יהושע will fall into a bad advice and fall in sin. אם יבואו לכלל לצרה, if they will uh, should sin, that he didn't want יהושע to sin. הואיל שהיה ענב, why? Because יהושע was humble and he had מידת הענבה. So now we understand one portion of the commentaries to understand the rest. Now let's uh, uh, we'll finalize this part and now everything will be clear. עוד יש לומר בתירוץ קושיות המפרשים now we have to add another thing what the commentaries are, and are adding. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray for Yoshua and not for the others? Forget about Kalev right now. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu take 11 men and put them on one side and Yoshua on the other side? Why Moshe Rabbeinu prays only for Yoshua and not for all the 11 uh, spies? The fact that Kalev didn't sin, that's very nice, and the other 10 sin, but another question that the commentary is asking, why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray only for Yoshua? Shashem Yatsila Miyatsarara. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu could pray for them? Don't pray for them to change their free will, but pray, pray for that the Yatsarara should not be so strong. Maybe uh, uh, pray for their uh, salvation and that they should have power to fight the Yatsarara. Venira Masopanim Adavar. It looks like Moshe Rabbeinu has favor towards Yoshua. Oh, for Yoshua you're praying? And for all the rest, you're not praying? This is called masopanim, a favor. You're not allowed to do such a thing. Imagine a father has six kids and he says, I like one of them the most. For him, I'll pray and uh, I'll give him all the candy and the treats and the toys and the rest. I don't care. So that doesn't make, so to say, one can ask, of course. doesn't make Moshe look great. Why are you praying only for Yeshua and not for the rest of the other guys? So we find as follows. Deita besefer Zera Barech. There is a book that is called Zera Barech. And this book was written by a rabbi called Rabbi Brachia Barech Shapira. Shapira, Shapiro. He is the student of Nathan Shapiro, Rabbi Nathan Shapiro, who is known as the Megale Amukot. I uh, not too long ago gave a story about the Megaleh Mukot and I gave a little bit of uh, history about the Megaleh Mukot. Nevertheless, the, his student, his name is Rabbi Brach Yabarech Shapiro. He has a book called Zera Barech. And this is a, a book that is a kind of a commentary on the Torah, but more on the Kabbalistic approach of the Torah. And he quotes from this book in the name of the Ariya Kadosh, He's quoting the Ariya Kadosh, has, uh, uh, it's not really a book, but it's compiled into a book called Likotei Torah. And in Parashat Shlach, uh, he's quoting something that the Ariya Kadosh wrote there. And he wrote as follows, Sham Katav, Gamken, Shelechach Hitpalel Moshe. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray uh, on Yoshua? Sheata beknisatam laaretz. Now when they went into the land of Israel, this is what the Arizal says in Likutei Torah, but the Zera Barech quotes it, and the Zera Shimshon quotes the Zera Barech, that's the book. When the Kadosh Bohu, when the spies went into Eretz Israel, what did the Kadosh Bohu wanted? That the souls of all the tribes should get impregnated into the spies. This is called Ibur, we learned that a few times. That the souls of the tribes should get impregnated into the bodies of the spies. Why? In order for them to be strong, to be rectified, and they should not sin. That's a pretty nice uh, gesture from the Kadosh Baruch He sends the spies. Hashem didn't want to send the spies. But he says, no, you know what? I'll have the souls of the tribes getting pregnant in them. 
If you remember, we learned that uh, a while ago in the Shara Gligulim, in Gates of Reincarnation, that there are th three types of ways how souls come back into this world. Either through a Gilgul, Gilgul is an incarnation, but that means that the soul comes into the body when the person is born and leaves the body when the person dies. This is called a Gilgul. The next way how a soul can come into this world is through what's called Ibu. Ibu is an impregnation and it can come into the body while the person is alive, stay there for a minute, a month, a year, ten years and leave. This is called the Ibu. And the third uh, uh, way is called Yibum. And that is already explained in depth in the Shari Ligulim. Yibum is when a man dies and he doesn't have kids, so his brother comes to the widow and he has to have a kid with her and then they bring a soul into the world. It's called Yibum, but Arizal goes in depth in the Gates of Reincarnation about it. You can find it in chapter 5 and 6 and 7 in Gates of Reincarnation. But nevertheless, here the Arizal says, or we should say the other word. The Zerah Shimshon is quoting the Zerah Barech, who's quoting the Arizal, that says that when the spies went into Eretz Israel, the Kadosh Baruch Hu wanted the souls of the tribes to get impregnated into the spies to assist them. And Arizal says in the Gates of Reincarnation that why would this happen? To assist the person. And each and every one of us, we don't really feel that, but we get uh, what's called an impregnation. You How many times? Tribe? Like Yeseshar, yeah, yeah, the yeah. Foundation of the tribe. Yeah, Yeseshar yeah. Yeseshar comes to the one, the one of that tribe representing the. A hundred percent. Okay. Yeah. Beautiful. So, the reason we even us, we can get a visit from a soul of a tzaddik as an impregnation to assist us. And how many times do we are in a time of weakness and we feel suddenly we have a boost? That could be an impregnation. But nevertheless, not to get off the subject, that's what Darizal is saying. But going back to what we're saying here, Darizal says, let's quote, go a little bit back, when they went into the land of Israel, the Kadosh Baruch wanted the souls of the tribes, from the actual tribes, the Levi, Yesachar, Yehuda, that their souls should be uh, impregnant into the bodies of the, the spies. To also give them power, to give them koach, to rectify them. That they should not sin. And even if that, when that happened, it didn't help. Omnam, but Levi, the son of the son of Yaakov, Levi, got impregnated in who? In Yoshua. Omnam Levi nitgelgel be Yoshua. Why? Kishevet Levi. The tribe of Levi didn't send a spy. You know why? Levi doesn't have a place in the land. He doesn't need a spy. So, but nevertheless, the soul of Levi got impregnated in the body of Yoshua. This is what he quotes, the book of Zerah Barech. Now that we see that the soul of Levi was the head of the tribe of who? Shel Moshe Rabbeinu. Levi was the head of the tribe of Moshe. Moshe comes from Levi. So we understand that Moshe Rabbeinu, it was close to him. It was his tribe. There's no masopani here. There's no uh, protection here. There's no... Uh, uh, it seems that Moshe has a favor. Klal, at all. Sheatau davar, no gelas mo'amash. He just said was very close to him. That was his tribe. Moshe Rabbeinu also it was part from the tribe of Levi. So we have here to conclude an answer, a few answers. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu did not pray for all the 11 spies? Why did he only pray for Yoshua? First of all, because he was from the same tribe. Moshe Rabbeinu prayed only for Yoshua, but not for all the, uh, all the uh, uh, spies. So first of all, we understand that he didn't want to pray for them in regards to not to change their free will. He says they all have free will. They should decide if they want to sin or not. It's their problem. It's not my problem. If we all get free will. You have to battle your own free will. But here we find here really the message what the Zerah Shimshon is trying to say. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray for Yoshua? First of all, we started the class by saying that he added to him the letters Yudke. And we were questioning that. He didn't add Yudke, he only added Yud. 
Hoshua already had the name, the letter He. He didn't add Yud and He, he had only Yud, Yehoshua, and his name was Hoshea. But nevertheless, he added the letter Yud K, when we mention why, because the name Yud K cannot dwell on a person that has Gava. And the person who has Gava, that's what we quoted from the Zohar, the ten men, the spies, had Gava. They did not want to be fired from their position. So therefore, the name Yudke could not dwell on them. Because the name Yudke cannot dwell on a person that has Gava. Yudke is 15, and the word Gava is also 15, the numerical value. So you, the Kadosh Bahu, sorry, Moshe Rabbeinu added the Yud and the K to Yoshua, even though he added the Yud. But he says, no, 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 I'm giving you the Yud and the Hey. Why? So you will be protected. Why did it only work to Yoshua? Because only Yoshua really had Midat Anava. This comes to explain to us why did Moshe Rabbeinu pray? Moshe Rabbeinu only prayed on Yoshua because only Yoshua had Midat Anava. And this comes to teach us the secret of all. If a person is not humble, prayer will not help. The prayer will only help when the person has Midat Anava. If a person has Midat Geva, the prayer will not work. Moshe Rabbeinu says, I cannot pray for them. As it doesn't matter how much I will pray for them, it's not going to work. You know why? Rak, only when a person has Midat Anava, then the prayer will work. And this is really the most powerful thing that we need to understand. You forget about now Lashon Ara, not Lashon Ara. The, the, the spies sinned. They didn't sin. They said the truth. They didn't say the truth. Eh, that, leave that to the commentaries. I want to learn from that. Why did Moshe Rabbeinu add to Yoshua Yud Kei? Because on the surface, he added only a Yud, not a Yud and a Hey. So we explain that very clearly, the Yud and the Hey, because Moshe Rabbeinu says here, I want the name of Hashem to protect you. I want the name of Hashem to bless you. And I want the name of Hashem to take you wherever you go, so you will be saved. And for that, he added a prayer, even though he really didn't add a prayer. But nevertheless, what is that prayer? Is to help him, save him and Matzat Meraglim from the sin. But when we're asking, well, so why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu pray for all of them? Because they had free will. So why didn't Moshe Rabbeinu didn't pray for Kalev? We see that Kalev didn't sin. So Moshe Rabbeinu says, with Yeshua, I know he's humble. Kalev, I don't know what's the status of his Midat Anava. But what do I want to take from that? I'm not, I, not only that I want to take from that the severity of Lashon Ara and lying and slandering. That's, we talked about that already a few times. I want to take from that that the prayer can be only affecting when a person has Midat Anava. The spies, the Zohar says, they had Midat Geva. They didn't want to lose their status. What did the spies say? We are going to go into the land of Israel. And what's going to happen? We are going to be fired from being the Nesim. Moshe Rabbeinu will switch us. They didn't want to lose their status. They had too much Geva. Besides, because they had Geva, then their prayer, even if Moshe Rabbeinu would pray for them, it wouldn't help. It wouldn't dwell on them. Their prayer will not help. So what do I want to take from that? This practically, that in order for a prayer to work, then I have to be humble. If I'm not humble, and if I have Midata Geava, then it will not work. And for that we can understand when we talk a lot about what's called Tikkun Amidot, the refinement of character. I have explained that in the same way that Shlomo Melech says, Zeh Lumat Zeh Bara Elokim, Kadosh Baruch created everything with an opposition. Now we're going to read about very soon about Bil'am in a few weeks. Then Bil'am was the Lumat of Moshe Rabbeinu. Everything has a Lumat But nevertheless, even in Tikkun Midot, there are some Midot that are good and some Midot that are bad. If you go to the highest of all Midot, on the good side, on the positive side, the highest of all the positive Midot is Midat, Anava. The Midah of Anava, of being humble. What's the Leumatze? What's the same, equal, but in the negative side? Midat, Agava, the Midah of pride. Now we're going to start learning about Korach. What triggered Korach? Gava, pride. Now when a person, his pride, his ego is being hurt and pushed, right away it will birth more midot. In this particular case, it will birth anger and sadness. That's how it works. And then will come jealousy and hate and so forth. And that's, the, that's how it starts. So it's same thing with Korach. Korach had Geva. I should be the one. You know the story with Korach. Korach was the son of Yitzhar. There were four brothers. The father of Moshe Rabbeinu was Amram. He was the, the top, the, 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 the oldest brother, the Bechor. Then was another brother, Hitzhar. He was the father of Korach. And then there was a third brother, Hebron. And then the fourth brother was Uziel. 
Uziel was the father of El Tzapan and Mishael. Who's El Tzapan and Mishael? These are the cousins of Nadav and Avihu that the, we spoke about it last week. These were the Kohanim that took out the bodies of Nadav and Avihu when they died. If you remember in the inauguration, Nadav and Avihu dies. They are the son of Aaron. Moshe Rabbeinu calls the cousins, Mishael and El Tzapan, and he tells them, you take the bodies out. These are the two individuals that came to Moshe in Parashat Behalotecha and say, wait a minute, we can't sacrifice uh, on Pesach, we're, we're impure. And therefore they got Pesach Sheni. When it's talking about the people who came to Moshe, who's, Mo who's the people who came to Moshe Rabbeinu? Who was impure? El Tzapan and Mishael. Why? Because two weeks later, before that, they came and they touched Nadav and Aviyu. But Moshe Rabbeinu told them, you take them out. But we're Kohanim, we're priests, we can't take, touch dead bodies. Nevertheless, take them out. Now, two weeks later, comes Pesach and they say to Moshe, we're impure, we touched Kohanim, we, we, sorry, we touched dead, dead people. Therefore, we got the Pesach Sheni. So, El Sapan and Mishael are the sons of Uziel, the youngest brothers of all. Now, in Parashat Naso, who's the head of the family of Kihat? The family of Kihat is Levi, then Kihat, then from Kihat comes Amram, Itzhar, Hebron and Uziel, the sons of Kihat. Then comes Amram, the father of Moshe. So who became the head of the family of Kihat? El Tzapan. Comes Korah and says, whoa, 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 whoa. I should be the one. Why? Because my father is second in line. My father is Yitzhak. He's the second. I should be the, the, the head. You're giving to the, the youngest? That's where Korah gets upset. That's where it all starts. I should be the one. So it starts with jealousy and ego. And from that, it, it, it turned into hate, Lashon Ara, and look what happened to Korach. So what are we concluding from all this? One thing, be humble. Midat Anava. And here we learn from that the, the prayer, when you want the prayer to help, you want the prayer to affect, it has to be Midat Anava. can be Geava. The, the second that there's Geava, there's pride, nothing will work. I told you once a famous story that happened here in Tzfat. The Arizal had a few students. One of them was giving over a Dvar Torah. It was so amazing, so brilliant, so unbelievable that suddenly as he's talking, they all look at the Rebbe, the Ari Kadosh, and suddenly his face goes like that. And then a few moments later, he goes again like that. A few moments later, he goes again like that. They don't understand. And then after a while, suddenly his face becomes shocked and sad, and that's it. They come later on and tell him what happened. So he says, while this individual, the student, was giving over this Dvar Torah, it was so amazing, then suddenly the soul of Avraham Avinu walks into the room. Ooh, the Arizal was like shocked. Moments later, the soul of Yitzchak. Moments later, the soul of Yaakov. He starts seeing, they're all coming in. Moshe Rabbeinu, Aaron, David the Melech. The Arizal was shocked, he sees them all. So they say, so why at some point you got so upset? He says, because they all just got up and leave. So the question is, why did they get up and leave? So the Rizal said to the student, because in the beginning you were giving this Torah, you were so into it, you were so uh, inspired, but for one moment you had a little bit of geava, a little bit of pride, that, look what I taught, look what I brought down. And the second, there was a little bit of pride, a little bit of ego, they all left. So we know that the Kadosh Baruch says, in Shorea Kadosh Baruch, the Kadosh Baruch cannot dwell in a place that is geava. That's it. So this is where we learn another important thing about this whole encounter is that one needs to be humble. And yes, the Yetzirah is going to constantly attack us. We're constantly going to be triggered and, and questioned and tested. And nobody can intervene because that's why we have free will. Kadosh Baruch says, I'm not going to intervene. You have free will. You choose the right thing. But, nevertheless, we see that we pray for everything. Every day we pray. People are sick, we pray. People need Parnassah, we pray. You want the prayer to work? You have to be humble. Person has midata geava, person is pride. What did the Zohar say? What did we quote from the Zohar? That the, the spies, they went into Eretz Israel. What did they say? We are now the heads of the tribes. If we're going to go into Eretz Israel, the status will change. We will be fired. Moshe Rabbeinu will appoint new leaders. Now we're going to lose our status. We don't want to lose our status, this Gava. Okay, so let's manipulate here. This is what Gava does, this is what pride does. And I think the message is very clear that one should be more humble and work on their Midata Anava in every situation than instead of having Gava, 
Everything comes from the Kadosh Baruch Hu. Kadosh Baruch Hu is the one who chooses who will be the leader, who will be the boss, who will be the successful one, who's going to be the one who leads, who's going to be anything. I have to be humble that whatever the Kadosh Baruch Hu decides, that's what's going to happen. Now we're going to learn about Korach. We're going to learn now not only about Korach, about the real troublemakers. People think that Korach was the troublemaker. Korach was just a jealous individual. There are another two job troublemakers, Datan and Aviram. These were the problem. These two were the problem. Not Korach. Korach just had an agenda. He just wanted to be a leader. The troublemakers were Datan and Aviram. That will keep it ready for the next class. But the point we want to take from that is something very simple. You want Yudke to dwell on you, the name of Hashem to dwell on you, is only when a person has Midata and Ava. All the revelations that all the prophets ever got, all the revelations that great Sadiqim ever got, Everything that was always achieved in the best way possible was only because Midata Anava, the Midah of Anava. Look at Moshe Rabbeinu. There was never a prophet like Moshe. Moshe Rabbeinu spoke to Hashem face to face. All the prophets got their prophecy while they were sleeping. Why? Moshe Rabbeinu had Midata Anava. So this is where we see the, 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 the saturation, the contrast between Geava and Anava. And any person that has a geava, what's called the Baal geava, that's the recipe for destruction, the recipe of all disasters. And needless to say that the key of everything, prayer, prayer doesn't work. The prayer, the key of prayer will not work when you have geava.